everybody. Good morning. We thank the band for that tune. That was on the radio this morning, David of the White Rock, in the morning service. Uh, and you can sing the words, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, to that tune. So thank you very much for that this morning. Our first song together, if you're using a songbook, is 344. 344. Four. Sing to God new songs of worship. All his deeds are marvellous. He has brought salvation to us with his hand and holy arm. He has shown to all the nations righteousness and saving power. He recalled his truth and mercy to his people, Israel. And you're going to use the tune that we sing joyful, joyful to if you're looking a bit bemused and you don't know the words. And we'll stand if you're able to sing. To help us in our prayer time this morning, we're going to turn to another song. It's 388, if you're using the book, 388. And we're really asking God to come and be at the centre of our worship and at the centre of our lives this morning. Jesus, stand among us at the meeting of our lives. Be our sweet agreement at the meeting of our eyes. Oh Jesus, we love you. And so we gather here, join our hearts in unity, take away our fear. And the second verse says, so to you we're gathering out of each and every land. Christ, the love between us at the joining of our hands. Oh Jesus, we love you. So we gather here, join our hearts in unity and take away our fear. I don't know what sort of week you've had. Maybe you've had a, a, a mountain top week and everything's been wonderful. Maybe you felt you're at the bottom of the valley and wonder what else can possibly go wrong this week for you. But whatever kind of week we had, God has been there and God has wanted us to sense his presence. And as we come into his house this morning, each one of us different, but each one of us loving the Lord, we're just going to sing these words before we pray this morning. Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to be in your house this morning. And we do pray that as we come to worship, you will join us together as one united people in you. We thank you for your son Jesus who came and died and was raised again to bring us our salvation. We thank you for the forgiveness that we find in him. And we do pray, Lord, this morning as we come to worship you, that we will have open minds and hearts, that we would listen and respond to what you have to say to us. And we pray, Lord, that we will be further equipped to meet the demands of the week that lies ahead of us so that we can serve you faithfully and that we can be light wherever you place us in this world. Father, we pray too for situations that we see on the television or in the news where there is so much hurt and so much want. And Lord, we pray that you would bring your peace to those places, that you would use your people to minister and to share the gospel. Father, we thank you for all those that are continuing to serve you in difficult situations. Brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted, <coughs> some in prison, some even losing their lives for you. Strengthen them, Father, and their families. And may they know, especially just now, your love and care and your grace which is sufficient for all things. But for ourselves, we ask as we join here to worship, that you will be in the centre of all that we think and do and say. Bless our fellowship together, and we pray that your name will be honoured and glorified in us and in this time of worship. Amen. I'm going to bore you a bit more with some more art. Uh, if we can have the first picture. This is, uh, today we're looking at Rembrandt. Paul the Apostle, painted by Rembrandt. Now, Rembrandt was a Dutch master, born in 1606. And some think that he was a truly great Christian artist. Because Rembrandt tried to show to us Bible stories. He painted quite a lot of Bible stories. And in his, in his pictures of Bible stories, he put real people in them. His friends and his neighbours he put in the Bible story pictures. But also, Rembrandt tries to show us grace. He applied the Bible to himself. Uh, one of the last paintings, which is a bit more famous, is the, last, is the return of the prodigal son, which is, which is one of his last before he died, which is, uh, some think this is Rembrandt looking over his life and saying, I am the prodigal who is returning because he had gone through quite a traumatic events in his life. Uh, so it was Rembrandt saying the son has come home, that he needed to receive grace from Jesus our Saviour. But we're going to look at two other paintings. If we have a little look at the next one, catchy. This is Rembrandt's painting. The first one, of course, was uh, Rembrandt's painting of the Apostle Paul. This, now, Rembrandt was fascinated by the Apostle Paul. He studied the Bible. Rembrandt studied the Bible for himself and heard it as a child. And it's thought even as he read the Bible, he even read Calvin's commentaries on the Bible. With the emphasis on God's grace and not his own merit. And so he was fascinated by the stories and the letters of the Apostle Paul. So here we have uh, one of his paintings of Paul. And uh, who should he put as, who should he paint as the Apostle Paul? But himself. So he paints himself as the Apostle Paul, writing one of his letters. Uh, you can't really see it in that picture, but he's also got Apostle Paul with a sword. There's a, if you look closely, it's very uh, dark, but, there is, but Apostle Paul's got a sword. Also, it's thought that the light shining from the top of the painting is reminding us of Paul's conversion when the light shined upon him. But the other one we're going to look at is another painting of the Apostle Paul by Rembrandt. Here we are. Now the sword's a bit more clear in this one. 
Uh, the previous one, you'd have to go to Amsterdam to see it. You have to go to America, to Washington, to the National Gallery of Art to see this one. But here, Rembrandt paints Paul where he ponders about what he is about to write. And there's a few things we can notice. First of all, his solemn expression, that he's deep in thought, as he's, or praying even, as he is about to write uh, a letter. We notice in this one a bit more clearly the sword standing behind there. Now, if this is Paul in prison, he wouldn't have had a sword. But this is meant to be symbolic of Paul writing to the Ephesians, where he writes about the sword of the Spirit being the word of God. But the other thing about this is the where the light shines. It shines in three places, if you note. First of all, on Paul's head, also on his hand with a pen in his hand, and thirdly, on the pages of the book that he's about to write. There's gentle light that illuminates his head, his hand, and the epistle. And perhaps uh, from this, we could think about our own lives, that not only we, as we read Paul's letters, because later on we're going to read the opening of Paul's letter to the Philippians. But also, may the light, the, gospel, the light of the gospel shine upon us on these three areas. It shines on Paul's head, or Rembrandt's impression of Paul's head. But maybe we want the gospel to speak to our minds and think about what the Bible says to us. It shines upon the Apostle's hand as he's about to write. And maybe we can think about what actions we take as being Christians, what we do as Christians, and the result of our actions of bringing help, bringing assistance, bringing comfort to someone else. And then lastly, it shines upon the pages on the table. The sword reminds us that the Bible is the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. So as we read the Bible for ourselves, as the light of the gospel shines upon, the light of God, I should say, shines upon the gospel, may that speak to us, to our situation, helping us, drawing us closer to God and enlightening us as to God, who God is and what the Lord Jesus has accomplished by his death and resurrection. So may the light of the gospel shine upon us today, upon our minds, upon our hands, and upon us as we open the word of God and be blessed by it today. Amen. We're going to sing again. It's not in the song it's uh, in the mission place so the words will come on the screen and while we're singing this song we'll take up or get, i can't take it up now can you can dance forward to put your money in the collection box um basket and then at the end after the song we'll, we'll pray so we're going to sing the church's one foundation is jesus christ her lord she is his new creation by water and the word from heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride with his own blood he brought her and for her life he died. Thank you, Jane.
Thank you, Father, for this time and thank you for this gift. We know that all good gifts come from you. We ask now that you bless the giver and also bless this gift. May it be used wisely to promote your work in this particular place. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible reading this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 1. But there's a wee introduction here to Philippians. Uh, Philip, the, uh, the, the letter is to a city called Philippi, the first place in Europe to hear the gospel. For in Acts chapter 16, we can read about the church beginning in Philippi. And so we'll read that first, just a few verses from Acts. Acts chapter 16. Sorry, Katya, I'm going to throw you a wobbly here. <laughs> so we'll not have these verses on the screen. And it says... And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavoured to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothrakia, and the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. So that is the beginning of the church in Philippi. A Roman colony made up of war veterans from the Roman army. Very proud of their city status and their special relationship that they had with Rome because of their Roman citizenship. <coughs> Paul and Silas visit the, uh, the city in 50 AD as we have just read from Acts chapter 16. The first three converts in Europe are Lydia, a seller of purple, and the church meets in her house for the first time. A demon-possessed slave girl and a jailer of the prison, which maybe is a familiar story to most of us. But the letter of Philippians, the whole theme of Philippians is joy. Joy mentioned 16 times in four chapters. So we're just going to read the first 11 verses of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds and the defence and the confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Amen. Now we're going to listen to the message of the band.
Thank you, band. That was a blessing. Let us pray. Lord, we pray as we open your word together that indeed your light might shine upon the words that we read. That your light will shine upon our minds as we think about what these words say to us. We thank you, Lord, that you inspired the writers of the Bible. We thank you, Lord, that you inspired Paul as he sat in a prison cell writing these words that we read today. But we thank you, Lord, that they applied to us today. So, Lord, may you help us to understand them. But we ask it through Jesus' name. Amen. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the opening two verses of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now many Christians find Philippians the most attractive of all Paul's letters found in the New Testament. Firstly because it's the easiest to read. It's not, uh, sometimes it hasn't got quite such a depth of theological argument that the others might have. Also it has a lot of warmth and encouragement which brings blessing to us. And also it has the theme of joy that we already said, joyfulness. When I first became a Christian, uh, the chap I worked with would pass me, would direct me in the books I should be reading. And one of the ones was a Guy King. Now I see they've all been republished, Guy King books. But uh, Guy King was a, an author of way back. And he wrote a, a commentary on Philippians. And it was called Joyway. So one of the first uh, commentaries I read on Philippians was by Guy King, Joyway. The New, the New English Bible gives the letter the heading, The Apostle and His Friends. And so that gives us a sort of a hint about what the letter is about. It's Paul writing to his friends in Philippi. And it shows the theme, in the whole, it shows through in the whole letter. When we write a letter today, and I don't know how many of us still write letters, I write a few letters. Not, or, I hand writes letters. I did read somewhere that uh, we're going to lose the, the ability to read handwriting because we read so much these days and it's all text. I don't know, can you, and when you do it at school, do you have to write your letters out? Do you have to write your essays out or do you type them? Type them? What, no writing at all? Very bad, right? When you think of all the writing you used to write when you were at school, your hands were sore. Jane, do you accept written, handwritten? You don't accept them. If a, if a student decides to use a pen and ink, not acceptable. Dear, dear, dear. That's, maybe that's one of the reasons why in years to come we'll be, in a, in a, in a, we'll be unable to read handwritten letters. But if you were to write a letter today, or even, although it's different with an email or a text, but if you write a letter today, we put our name at the end of the letter. With love, Jim. I used to write to my wife. To the future. <laughs> It was Jimmy, I used to write Jimmy in those days. I'm still Jimmy in my family, but it was Jimmy in those days. We put our name at the end. But in Paul's day, the name of the sender was put first. So that's why it says that the very, the first two letters, are, well, the first two words are Paul and Timothy. So we, we put the sender first. Then after that, who is receiving it? followed by greetings. 
And so that's the, the order that we find in Philippians. The sender, the receiver, and then greetings. But Paul does not just bring simple greetings in verse 2. He wishes grace and peace. Grace, God's love for the unworthy, revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the life, it was, the, it was Jesus' life, death and resurrection that has been revealed to us and to the world and has revealed to us the grace of God. Peace, the Hebrew word shalom, spiritual and physical peace and well-being. And of course Jesus himself said, my peace I give you. So that's where Paul says, that's where Paul begins his letter. His name, who's to receive it, and this greeting of grace and peace. So that's what Paul says comes from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So no ordinary greeting. It reveals to us the salvation that God has provided to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. It shows the love, the power, and the plan of the great God for your life and for mine. But who is the letter for? The Philippians. But also for us today. For this letter through the inspiration of God, speaks to our lives and to our hearts. And we're told in this very first verse of chapter 1 that the Philippians have four characteristics. First of all, they are saints. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. This is the New Testament word to describe every Christian. Saints or holy ones, or people who are set apart. And we find that in lots of Paul's letters, where he refers to the Christians as saints. Romans chapter 1, verse 7, for instance, or 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. People who are set apart to belong to Christ. It does not refer to only Christians that the church recognises in a spiritual way, or a special way. People, but, but people who have been set apart, or who have been cut off from their previous life, from their old way of life, but now following a new way of life in Christ Jesus. They belong to Christ, and it is only through blessing by the Lord Jesus Christ that they have become saints. But they are also in Christ Jesus. Paul's favourite way of describing a Christian is referring to Christians as in Christ. He uses the expression in the Lord or in Christ Jesus well over 100 times in his letters. But what does it mean? It helps us to understand this phrase when we remember that Paul taught those who are now in Christ were once in Adam. The first man, Adam, was appointed by God as a representative for the whole human race. Whatever Adam did had consequences and repercussions for others and for us. Jesus is the last Adam for Paul. Jesus came to do all that Adam failed to do and to, un and to undo all that Adam did through the fall. In Jesus' death and resurrection, he overcame the power of sin and our guilt and death and he dealt with the reign of the devil. When we are in Christ, we begin, we begin to share in the blessings of all that he did for us. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us 
with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So they are saints and they are in Christ. But they are also in Philippi. Paul and Timothy to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi. Now at first glance this just looks like an address. That's who the letter has been sent to. It was being sent to encourage the believers who were living in the city of Philippi. It was Paul who had founded the church that we read of earlier in Acts 16. He had founded the church in Philippi and Paul could not forget them, nor could they forget him. There was a special bond between them. He had visited them then during his third missionary journey and the Philippians had also organised a collection to help the impoverished church in Jerusalem and had sent a gift. But they had also sent a gift to Paul by one of their members and Epaphroditus and while he was with Paul he had been taken ill and almost died but now he was able to travel back and take this letter the letter to the Philippians back to the church there but this also speaks of our Christian life in two different kingdoms we are in Christ but we are also in Philippi or for us in Belfast or if you don't live in Belfast in Carrickfergus Raymond or wherever else you're living at the minute or, or Newton Ards or Finnicky for those of us who are privileged to live in Finnicky we belong to Christ as Paul will write uh, to the Philippians uh, later on in his letter, our citizenship is in heaven, he writes in chapter 3, verse 20. Or the Living Bible says, our homeland is in heaven. Or in the old song that Jim Reeves used to like, that my lo mother loved, this world is not my home. I was expecting a wee bit of feedback there. I was expecting at least a bar of the words of Jim Reeves' tone. <laughs> John Stott says, They are saints because they believe they belong to God. They are believers because they have trusted in Christ. And they have two homes, for they reside equally in Christ and in Philippi. Indeed, all Christian peoples, all Christian people are saints and believers and live both in Christ and in the secular world. Many of our spiritual troubles arise from our failure to remember that we are citizens of two kin kingdoms. We tend either to pursue Christ and withdraw from the world or to be preoccupied with the world and forget that we are also in Christ. So we are members of two kingdoms. We are here in our secular world, but we are also in Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are also to live out our Christian lives and to witness to the Lord Jesus where he has planned us. Now I'm a bit of a uh, a fall for all the time in bargain. And I w we were in the uh, the garden centre, and they had for half price lights from a garden. So I bought two of them, and I liked it so much I went back to the garden centre and bought another six. <laughs> That's in top that, because we're half price. They're kicking you, bargain you. And that's on top of the other four that I bought in Sainsbury's for 50p each. Like, how can you go wrong for 50p each? I also got some uh, lamp 
lengths for the fence. Now they're all solar powered uh, fence, so my garden's going to look like black hole illuminations, won't it? Now, all these lights. I did also buy a flashing uh, lighthouse from 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 Littles, which is, which is very good. But unfortunately, our lights gone out in the lighthouse, so there's a problem there. But uh, sorry. Oh yeah, and I've got a, I've got a, in, I've got a, uh, an insect thing, a flying insect that lights up at night as well. So it's all looking very pleasant, isn't it? But here we have a torch, a light for the garden, powered by solar panel. Now don't ask me how a solar panel works, but it takes the light from the sun during the day. And then it charges up the body, a battery. But when it gets dark, I hope this works, the light comes on. Right. So it's all very effective, isn't it? I was going to get catchy to switch off the lights, but I wasn't sure if it would work or not. It wasn't dark enough. So the light comes on. But, so we've got another one here. Two, two. Two for the price of one. <laughs> Eight for the price of four. But what happens when it gets dark and no light comes on? No light. No light. But we'll get dark with this one. We're lighting away there. And I did think about that and I thought, well, what happens? We, we take in light and spiritual lives. We take in the light of God in our lives and, and everything goes along nicely when the sun's shining. We all enjoy it when the sun's shining, when it's bright and it's warm. But then sometimes the dark, well, all, every night the darkness comes. But what happens in our spiritual life when the darkness comes? Are we like these two uh, solar lights? That when the darkness comes, our light still shines. That even though we might face trials or troubles or problems or difficulties, when the trouble comes, does our light still shine? Or when the trouble comes, has our light gone out and not shining at all? And it applies just as much to me as it does to each one of us. Does our light still shine? Or does it go out? Does my light still shine in Arnvale when the dif when the difficulty comes, or or does it go out, or do I let it go out? The solar panel works because it takes in power from the light and from the sun and stores it for when the darkness comes. And maybe that's a lesson for us that we should be taking in. We're enjoying the presence of God. So when the, when the darkness does come, when the difficulty day, difficult days do come, then we are able to shine out, that the light continues to shine. So we are to shine as lights in our dark world. We live in a sin, sinful environment at Philippi, or in Belfast, or wherever. Here we are called to live as alien residents, but here we are called to shine as lights. And may our witness shine out wherever we are, even when the days are difficult. Sometimes we try and work out where people come from by our accents. My wife, of course, has been living here longer than she lived anywhere else. But you can notice she's got a good Belfast accent, haven't you? Right? Although I have uh, wondered once or twice I do correct her in her English and say, that's a Belfast phrase you're using there. I don't have any of that. Or maybe people try and work out from our lifestyle. Or people say to us, where do you belong? Or where do you come from? If our emphasis and our lifestyle marks us out as being in Christ, then our living and witness 
is effective. So we are in Christ, we are saints, and we are in Philippi. Lastly, Paul says, with the bishops and the deacons. They are with the bishops and the deacons. And it's not clear why Paul includes this phrase at the beginning of his letter. And there are lots of theories, but this is the only occasion in the New Testament that Paul addresses a congregation in this way. The reasons could have been, and as I say, there's many theories about why he includes the bishops and the deacons. Perhaps they took the lead in sending the gifts of money to the church in Jerusalem and to Paul himself. Perhaps they would be responsible in carrying out the details of the letter. Or perhaps it's to emphasize that they were a group of God's people, not just individuals. Now, we went fishing in uh, Fermanagh, as you know, we had a week, nice week there. We had gone fishing one day and we were coming back. People in the next cabin shouted over, did you catch any fish? And I was able to say in all good conscience, yes, we caught some fish. Because uh, one of us caught a lot more fish than others. Um, but I was using the royal we. We did catch some fish. They weren't asking me if I caught any fish. Because uh, somebody else caught more than me. In fact, I didn't catch any that day. <laughs> but we are not alone, are we? We're not on our own. We are a core of God's people. We are not individuals. And perhaps this is what Paul is emphasizing in this letter. We are not individuals. Our Belfast Citadel is not just the officers or the local officers or the soldiers or the adherents or whoever attends to our hall. We are one together. We are a core. We are a group of God's people. And perhaps this is what this letter is emphasizing to us. We are one together one family, one group of God's people. It's almost 2,000 years after, they, after these pages were written, but they speak to us with freshness and power. Our situation and circumstances differ from the first readers in Philippi. But in the message they received, we hear the voice of the Spirit of God addressing us still today. It was written by Paul for all the saints in Philippi. It is meant by the Spirit of God for all the saints in every age and in every place who, as it says in, Philippi, in Philippians 2 verse 11, all that confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And may that be true for each of us as a group of God's people, that we are a witness in the place where God has placed us and our light shines in the place where we are. Amen. Let's turn to a song together as we consider our prayer. 383, if you're using the book, 383. Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God. Lord of eternity, dwells in humanity, kneels in humility and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty, bow down and worship, for this is your God.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us here today. We thank you, Lord, that you have shone your light of your love upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have given to us your word, inspired by you, and it speaks to our everyday situations. We thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus Christ to be our Saviour and Lord, that that through his death and resurrection we can know newness of life. We can know we are set apart for you. We can know that you have blessed us to be your witnesses of your saving power. Lord, may we know your presence today. May your word speak to us every day. May you draw us close to yourself, that when the darkness does come, our light continues to shine. That when the darkness does come, that your your presence is not blocked out, but we are aware of you no matter what we are going through today and in the future. So Lord, we ask that you will continue to bless us, that we continue to know your presence, that in our love, in our service, and in our witness, Lord, that you will continue to help us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our closing song is 241. 241. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? You will notice that this song is filled with uh, thoughts taken from Philippians. Second verse says, He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. And then maybe uh, Charles Wesley was thinking of the Philippian jailer in verse 3, long man prison spread lay, or, sorry, Paul and Silas in verse 3, long man prison spread lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, thy nine diffused a quickening ray, I woke the dungeon flamed with light, my chills, chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. 241, and we'll stand to sing.
condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. The last verse. <laughs> Now the Lord Jesus bless each one of us as we go from this place. Watch over us and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, Amen.